Welcome to the Caterpillar Mining Webinar Series. I'm Tony Johnson and I'll be your host today. We're coming to you live from the Caterpillar Media Center here in Peoria, Illinois. Looks like we've got a good group uh, registered online for our webinar today. I see we've got Mexico, Chile, Brazil, Peru, Russia, Australia, Canada, several from Europe and of course the United States. So we welcome you. We welcome our miners, our dealers, uh, our Caterpillar employees, students, and anyone else from the industry that's with us today. Today we're going to talk trucks. Uh, that's a pretty broad to topic, but we've got the right group here to do that. I'd like to introduce our panel today. I'm John Engel. I'm the uh, Product Performance Manager for the large mining trucks out of Decatur, Illinois. I've been in mining about 35 years and with CAT for 30 years. Yeah, John spent a lot of his time uh, in mining. I know I've worked with him a lot. Uh, really from the economic and performance modeling side, but now in the product group and the product design. So John's seen really kind of the, the very introduction of cat trucks. You've kind of lived it all, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Cameron. Uh, Cameron McGovern. I've got about 20 years with Caterpillar and about eight years before that with several dealers around the world. Uh, all of my time has been in mining and uh, all of it in product support. So. Uh, I'm a product support manager. I have a group of guys that support one of the, our major regions in the uh, site performance manager area and most of my experience has been based on sites looking at performance and improving performance uh, of our large fleets through continuous improvement, best practices, maintenance and repair processes. And yeah, that's really a unique skill set that Cameron has. In fact, I think one of the advents we've seen in trucks is the is the, the focus on it. it used to be you just delivered the trucks and kind of the miners would take care of it but more and more we're being involved uh, between Caterpillar and the dealers with what is the actual performance uh, on site. John? Yeah, John DeSellum. I'm the global commercial manager for CAT Command which is really our autonomous technologies for mining. Uh, been with the CAT family for about 20 years with uh, dealers and, and with Caterpillar itself. Most of my career focused on product support, but uh, really the last 10 years focused in on the solutions business and working with customers to help them derive value from our products. Um, really in 2011 I got involved with uh, the autonomous program and uh, spent four years actually living on site with our mm -hmm. customers over in Australia to, to stand up our first commercial offering of uh, Cat Command for Hauling over there. Yeah, you mentioned the solutions business. I mean, the solutions is kind of a broad term uh, that's evolved, but I, I kind of liken it to a solution is you come into a restaurant, you don't get the menu. You come in, you sit down, and, and you talk to the waiter about what you want, and they come back and bring you exactly what you need, and that's kind of what the solutions business is. And autonomy has been a big part of that, and you've, you've lived it from the start. Absolutely. It, it starts with what's the customer need and what's the value that they're trying to derive and then we work with them to customize solutions whether that's with technology or people or processes that Caterpillar's got to really bring the best that Caterpillar has to bear to our customers mind site and help them get all the value that we build into our products out. Yeah absolutely so it looks like I got 30, 20, 20 and 30 we got a century of uh, experience uh, sitting here and, uh, and myself I've spent a lot of time in the field and, and working with trucks too so we're really excited to talk uh, trucks with you today. Before we get into kind of the meat of the topics, I'd like to just go through your interface. That's the, the system that you're looking at. In the upper left-hand corner, there's a, a box that has links to profiles on all of your speakers here. You can click around on that and send us an email. Right below that is a resources uh, box. You can, uh, there'll be several links that we'll refer to during the program today, so we ask that you spend time and kind of click around with that. And on the right side of your interface, you'll see our a question. Uh, we do have a team backstage that's monitoring questions. They will feed those to us here during the program. So if you do have a question, be, feel free to add that. Lastly, uh, we're planning on being less than an hour, so we hope that you can stay with us through the whole time. However, if you can't, this will be recorded and you'll get an email within a day with a recording to this webinar. We'd ask that if uh, you feel that there's value in it, please share that with your peers. Okay, guys, let's get started. Let's talk trucks. Now, that's a big issue. Uh, as we've talked about, I think in the 30-some years, it's kind of the advent of you know, our introduction with 785 into mining trucks and bringing mechanical drive, and then the, you know advancing up through as the trucks get bigger to the 797. Uh, the tire issue, we'll talk tires a little bit today. That was there was a period there where you just couldn't get tires. Um, we introduced electric drives, so Cat had both mechanical and electric drives in a period. And then we inherited new electric drive trucks with the Cyrus acquisition through Unit Rig, and we're going to talk about some of that today. Um, 
I think that it is a big issue. So let's hone it back into what are some of the hot issues as we talk about this today. John, you spent a lot of time, Mine Expo was just six months ago, spent a lot of time with customers there. What are the top four or five issues that when it related to trucks that they were talking to you about from the production aspect? Yeah, it was great, Tony, to get together with everybody. And <clears throat> I got the sense that the industry is ready to roll our sleeves up and get back into it. Uh, there was, I would say, four things that I noticed a lot of common conversations around. The first would be getting um, more with less. You know, mm -hmm. as a lot of the mines had to push their equipment. Um, they've parked up trucks and they're trying to ramp up production now without adding trucks. Uh, so we see a big focus on getting utilization up, more efficiencies. One of the areas I've seen on efficiency is moving to, say, larger, less frequent blasts. So you don't have to interrupt your productivity so much with the blasts. We get a lot of data off of uh, our trucks, and I was in looking at our utilization reports, and it's really interesting. You can see in the last three or four years the utilization of our trucks coming up fast and higher and higher. So the miners are getting a lot out of those trucks today. Another way they're getting higher utilization is moving up to larger trucks. Uh, autonomy is a big factor. We'll talk about that today. Using technology in all sorts of ways, helping getting uh, more efficiency and utilization going. Yeah, I think it, especially uh, we saw it at Mine Expo, for example, just the data and the technology everybody had. And then really, that's probably been the step change at the right time as, uh, you know, new truck purchases aren't as high as maybe they were where the period where it was. Everybody's trying to get more out of it. And, and the technology and data that comes off to that was a, was a big play in, in helping with that, kind of getting more out of the asset. A couple other things you you heard there too, right? Yeah, so um, getting more value out of the assets, the big part, not just doing more with less. And uh, what we see is uh, extending those component lives on the machines, getting the machine lives out there. We have machines 100,000 hours, even higher, 104,000 hour. Customers are working hard to keep those going. We've got one customer that's focused on just 793s. They keep rebuilding them, keep running them. Um, but and payload, that's another big area. Big focus on trying to get the payload out of that. Now, to do that though, that's the fourth area and that's controlling cost. And when they start pushing things like this, you have to watch the cost side of this. If you right. go too far, that doesn't pay. Uh, and you mentioned the, the data. You know, I think for a long time, our industry's had a lot of available data with VIMS and, and those type of things. Uh, almost to the point of overload, where I think our customers over just kind of through their hands. Or even up. ourselves. Yeah, yeah we what did. do you do with it? Yeah. So, but now I am seeing a better utilization of that data. You see miners, uh, so another way of controlling costs is extending uh, service intervals, but they're doing things to track with critical uh, performance indicators, mm -hmm. more real time analysis of that data to see if, if it's working, where their costs are under control like that. It, you know, a, a good example of that is at Caterpillar, we have ECA or equipment. Um, Care condition visor, yeah. care, care visor. Yeah. and what we do there is we gather all this data from the field coming in from the machines we look at uh, SOS samples fluid samples inspection reports and they take that and they can run a more proactive analysis of the health of those machines so that's a good example of where we're doing that what else too I mean we're going to talk a lot of autonomy where you don't really need operators but people and operators were a discussion for you too, weren't they? That's absolutely correct. Uh, the, probably the fourth big area we talk, you hear a more conversation coming back around is, you know, as we started into the downturn, we couldn't get people. It was hectic, you couldn't get mechanics. Uh, and now, as we come for the downturn, what we've really had is uh, a lot of loss of experience. And as we start to look at the future, we're realizing that uh, through attrition, we've lost people. Uh, that's not all bad. I think we're bringing a new group of people in with some great new perspectives and ideals. But we lost that chance to mentor and train, and it's going to be something we're going to have to, to really manage. Uh, and a great example of that is I, I was out with an operator of mine just recently. He was as old as the truck was. Yeah, and, and that isn't that the operator was really old. It's that he was really young. He was the young. Truck, uh, yeah. comparatively, and the truck was pretty old. was pretty old yep. at the same time, and that's not something that, that we've really seen. So yep. now. There was another subject I remember you talking about, and it's one that for 30 years we kind of uh, kind of cringe about, but a lot of people saying, hey, listen, I got to get as much out of this as I can. I'm going to overload the truck. I'm going to push that payload distribution. What's kind of our response and approach to that? Yeah, so you're spot on from the standpoint of, you know, we talked about getting the most out of the asset. And, you know, over the years, I've watched this kind of vacillate back and forth between managing payload and overloading, sort of a battle between production and, mm -hmm. and the maintenance people. 
And there's definitely more of an attitude now of, of trying to load the trucks a lot more. Um, and we, if you go back a long time, the industry started to have to deal with that. And CAD introduced a, a program called the 10-10-20 payload policy. And I think today it's pretty well accepted. It helps us understand that the more empty weight you put on a truck, you're going to take out payload. Right. It helps us understand that there's a distribution to a load. If we can squeeze the distribution down, you're better off to kind of stop those, those events that go way out, that takes life out of the truck. The industry's accepted that about 120% of the um, rated payload is a good safety target to hold back from. That's where the manufacturers, Caterpillar, other people, have really said, here's the test point for brake and steering and standards. So that's kind of that upper limit. But I have seen sort of a trend to forget about the fact that the optimum point of the truck where we as a manufacturer feel the best cost per ton optimum performance is, is what we call that rated payload. Mm -hmm. And there is definitely a trend to try to squeeze that distribution down even more today and try to scoot that average up. That, that will have implications. And back to that data and management, if you don't compensate for that with better strut maintenance or road maintenance or training, you will end up taking life out of the product. And look, I know it's very um, application dependent, so there are some customers that are making this work, but it's something everybody's gotta be very careful about and really pay attention to. And, and I would like to see people still adhere and watch the 10, 10, 20 policy. Yeah, absolutely. Now, John, we're gonna talk about autonomous trucks in a minute, but it begs the question is, in your experience with autonomous trucks, how has that payload distribution? I mean, it's still up to the loading tool to do yeah. it. So just because, but do you see better payload distribution and, and working to that with autonomous trucks? So I think I think we've seen some of the same challenges. Certainly, we've we've taken out some of the variables with it, where we've got a consistent operator with autonomy, mm -hmm. and, and that that adds you know more to where you can go ahead and then look at the data and say, okay, what's really in here and what's out. But all the same things that we've been talking about. I mean, you you got to go ahead and still. You got to make sure your roads are in the right condition, that uh, you, you're keeping your struts charged optimally, and and really making sure that that's that's balanced for that truck and it's and it's empty weight as right. it sits. You know to really go ahead and be able to get that because, you know, with autonomy because we don't have a lot of the lunch breaks and things like that, we're, we actually find we're we go ahead and we run into tire heat issues because of the amount of time that we're running. Right. So we've really had to take a really close look right. at, at payload specifically and, and helping customers to really optimize not just overall their targets and are they adhering to them, but, but really load placement and centering in the tray to go ahead and keep that there and, and back to strut maintenance. I mean, that's, that's absolutely critical so that we can balance that load across all six tires of the truck and, and really keep that that working well, but we've we've gotten some really great data back with autonomy that, you know, by taking some of those variables out right. and all the great data that we get off of VIMS and everything that now we're we're looking at, and we can go ahead and maybe make a more uh, unbiased decision, right? I think it gives credibility to what John was talking about because in the autonomous world, you're looking for optimum every time, yeah, right. So it it puts credibility to what John's saying is that when we get to that optimum, we're seeing those issues like that. Well, that, that's right. I mean, it's it's about the consistency, and, and it starts with the consistency of that payload. You know, so are we are we on that standard deviation? Are we getting the squish to get a, sh a small standard deviation, and then looking at that that really where are we falling in that ten ten twenty rule with that mean? That, that, we're, that we're hitting and not exceeding any of the other thresholds. We have a question that's come in too as we're talking kind of payload here. What, John, what's the impact of, you know, we, it's designed with a cat body specifically, but of course there are other options to put on bodies out right. there. Just what, what's kind of a couple of talking points on that? Um, as far as uh, other manufacturer trays, um, there's a lot of options people have out there, but I think that they forget to understand that the body has to be designed with the truck. So first we were just talking about heat and balance. So not only the placement of the load is critical, but if a body isn't properly balanced or located with the truck as a system, you'll tend to get front bias, which is yep. again bad for tires. And I think the other thing that people don't realize is the way that body mounts up to the frame is very critical. Uh, CAT designs our bodies, they go into rocker pads and we take the loads in for the frame a certain way. And I've seen uh, other non-caterpillar uh, bodies out there in the industry that, is, are, that are misloading the frame, and that can cause issues. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, you've talked about kind of what the top production-related issues were, and Cameron's been sitting here in the middle thinking how I, on the maintenance side, I see the impacts of this. So, 
What are some of the maintenance issues that have been been topical today? Yeah, so you know, and, and with Mine Expo only six months ago, you know, one, we had that same conversation. It was possibly the same gentleman or people at the at Mine Expo talking to us as well. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about suspension and maintenance, so I don't want to harp on it. But um, you know, when you talk about being able to mentor these people that are new into the industry, we've lost some of the experience. It's one of those back to back to the foundational things of suspension cylinder maintenance. You know? And so we, we did have a lot of conversation about, you know, with the overloading, the 10, 10, 20, but also, you know, again, the, the grassroots of you have to get that right. It's one of those key things. It's a foundational element. And if we don't get it right, then we're going to cause a lot of problems in a lot of areas and just drive costs, you know. Um, what were some of those other issues that were topical in the maintenance world? So, um, so there's a whole bunch of them. I'm yeah, sure, a lot yeah. of so probably the key one talk about availability. We always talk about availability, um, but not, not only just in delivering availability that meets the the required budgeted hours needed for production, but it was also we we talked a lot about being able to provide that in a way that's very reliable. And I think that plays in you know exactly what John just said about with the autonomous trucks that don't stop for shifts, uh, yeah. sorry, lunch breaks and those sorts of things, driving some tire heat. Uh, it's the same way. We want to be able to develop uh, processes and procedures that we can ensure that the truck is reliable when it goes to work um, because nothing interrupts production like having frequent stoppages. So it's critical to deliver uh, a high availability but also a high mean time between stoppage or an MTBS which is one of those performance metrics that we use to monitor fleet performance. Um, some of the other things was on our key maintenance and repair processes you know, some customers and, and dealers were talking about optimizing PMs, um, setting up dedicated PM bays with dedicated people and tooling and those sorts of things. And we talked a lot about we have to maintain a balance between you can't just do one thing very well. If you do a PM very well, but you fall down in some of the other areas with inspections and condition monitoring and planning and scheduling, you will not get the value out of dedicating a bay, spending all the money, training people, and those sorts of things. So you have to do it in, in a balance. Um, we talked about doing things like t utilizing windows of opportunity during a fuelage stop, doing pre-PM inspections, daily inspections, and those sorts of things, allowing the planning and scheduling department to ensure that you get the right parts, um, you get the right tooling, people, and anything additional that you need. And then at that PM stoppage, you have the time, it's planned and scheduled, and you make that repair. Um, you know, it's a, pr a proactive repair. Yeah, we, we touched on that as well. We know it drives costs if you have a repair after failure type of uh, result. Uh, and the industry talks about, you know, it's seven or eight times more as expensive mm -hmm. to repair after failure than before failure. And I think there's plenty of examples where a leaking hose or a rubbed hose can, com can cause a component failure or something like that. That's an easy example. But uh, you know, again, it's all about driving reliability, delivering that availability, and all of those maintenance and repair prices have to be done together. Yeah, I think the other thing that we're seeing, at least from the manufacturer's side, is, is the demand for components, right? And, and the, the, the really need and part of your process is to plan those components, uh, especially as we start ramping up. Uh, we had a webinar a couple of months ago, Tim Siegman was here, uh, in fact, that webinar is out there for recording if you want. It's uh, three ways to optimize your mining operation today. It'd be a good time to, to, to go check that out and watch it. But he was talking about the importance of working with your cat dealer to, right. to really plan that. It helps us make sure that there's proper supply out there. All right. So, hey, we have a question that comes in. It's kind of in your space. I'm going to yeah. hold on a minute on autonomous trucks. But let, let's move and talk about that just a minute. Um, you, the, you know... The production and maintenance kind of hot issues, but probably one of the hottest in the truck space is autonomy. And I know we first talked about it at Mine Expo in 96, but just six months ago in September, it really felt real, not only for trucks, but across drilling and dozing and underground and everything. So what's, what's been your what's been the hot topics in your world for the last uh, last few years? Well, I mean, you know, I, th I think the key thing is, is that, you know, it's really become a reality. And, and, and it's, it's a proven reality, right? We've got several customers worldwide now. Uh, we've got 80 trucks running around the world at three different continents. And, uh, you know, we've hauled over 400 million tons autonomously 
with zero lost time incidents for safety around any of this. So, you know, that that's really added a lot of credibility to what we're doing here, and it's real. It's not a science experiment. It's not a project. It's not something that's just getting started up. This is, it's, it's really real with customer testimonials that are out there now, what we've been able to achieve. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at Mine Expo, uh, we, I thought it was wonderful because we were able to go ahead and for the first time we brought large groups of customers in to our, our Tanaha Hills demonstration in area. Tucson, Arizona, yeah. And, and we've, got, we've got a really nice setup there where we do a, a normal mainline demo like a lot of customers have seen, but we actually had a technology-specific mm -hmm. demo and the, the trucks were the star of the show there for sure. You know, we had uh, autonomous trucks there where everybody could see, you know, okay, it's a truck. Right. It, it doesn't do anything crazy. It, it just operates really consistently, gets loaded, moves fast, stops when it needs to, keeps going the rest of the time. And that, that's really brought it to the reality for a lot of customers where they see this and they're like, okay, this is real. Right. And, and maybe this makes sense for me now. Right. And, and and as a lot of customers are, are starting to go ahead, you know, I think we've all kind of found the bottom of this downturn. Right, right. And, and, and in many cases, a lot of customers' commodity prices, not only do they stabilize, but they're starting to return. Right. And a lot of these customers are looking at this and saying, okay, we've, we've spent time really tightening the belts and, and really tidying up our processes, but now, you know, is this something we need to be looking at so that in the next couple of years we can leapfrog when things really come back on and, and really optimize our mind? Yeah, I would remind you too, if you go to the resources section in your interface and scroll down just a couple, there's actually a video of that demonstration that he talked about and it's really cool. It, the, the, the demonstration opens with four autonomous trucks coming out of nowhere and uh, it's, it's really impressive. And, and too, if you're uh, interested in that, uh, a visit to Tucson, Arizona to our uh, demo center is well worth it. These guys have done a great job of, of getting that set up and it's ready to, to kind of be publicly displayed. So. So that that's hot. What is some of the value that you're seeing that that you know one? It's not for everybody, correct? That's right. So uh, there's probably uh, a, only a certain percentage that are really truly ready for autonomy. But they, those that are ready, they're getting some value out of. Yeah, and look, it goes back to we we always talk about any of our technologies, but you know, command technologies or autonomy specifically. It's really all about people, process. And then the enabling technology right. goes with it. So, you know, as we've tidied up a lot of these processes in our minds during this downturn, we've gotten more efficient. There's more customers that are probably ready for this kind of thing. But it, 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 it really becomes dependent on those processes being rock solid. Uh, autonomy amplifies processes. So if you've got bad processes, you're just going to be a hot mess with autonomy because the, the trucks will do exactly what they're told every time. So if you don't really know what you're telling them, or you inconsistently tell them, that's how they're going to operate. Right, right. If you're a customer that's really got your things optimized, whether it's your haul roads or your maintenance programs or how you go ahead and use every minute of the day, if you're that top quartile customer, you can take advantage of these and, and, and really go ahead and autonomy amplifies your processes to make them even better. Um, you know, as far as where are we really targeting with this, I mean, we've architected the system from day one to really focus in on our larger mine sites where the greatest value is going to be at for customers. Um, so so there, there's, there's three main value drivers that customers have seen, you know, and that, and that we've repeatedly shown. It's really around uh, your, your people costs. Uh -huh. um, the next one is, and that's, and that's all in, right? So larger sites have more people. Right. You got to have four and a half people or so per truck. To fly in, fly out versus drive in. You know, Absolutely, it's, it's you know, and, and a lot of the drive in places as well, you've got, you've got, you know, a domicile workforce that you're not paying for food and flights right. as, you, you know, as FIFO would be, but also you'd have, uh, you, you, typically you've got lower cost of that labor because you're not asking people to leave their families day in and day out, you know. So um, people cost is the first one. The, the, the second one really goes back to, you know, John talking about doing more with less. And it's about that utilization. Now, obviously, with autonomy, we're going to reduce time. We're going to get more time out of the day. And we've typically seen 10% or more improvement in utilization of availability. And that's from, you know, no lunch breaks, no smoke breaks, no shift change. You know, we see. And, and, and some of that also comes out in that while we don't have a shift change in that obvious downtime, we no longer have that bunching right. and everything else that goes along with that because it's constant flow across the shift. Um, 
the, the third piece is really the productivity. And, and, and the productivity, I'm talking about in-cycle productivity where you know, we're able to go ahead and, and do repeatable fast exchanges at, at the shovel. Um, whereas operator to operator in a, in a manned world, you may have one operator that exchanges at the digger really well and spots in perfect. And the next guy, he might not have the same skill set due to this, you know, we're, we're, we're changing the skill set of the operators with newer people coming on. And, and autonomy is able to do that consistently every time. And we get a really nice... Um, consistent exchange, you know, in the in the 30-second range if we got a good setup. And, and that, that adds to in-cycle productivity, but also because all our drivers are the same and they've been programmed by us to, to drive to the capability of the truck, we're going to go ahead and run as hard and as fast as we can within the limits of the truck and within the limits of our, our, um, our thresholds, you know, where, where operator to operator you may have an inconsistency there. So, you know, people costs, uh, utilization and productivity are your key, you know, value drivers that you can stick a number to, and 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 you know makes sense for customers with large mind sites, expensive cost basis of people, uh, but also the ones with those processes to optimize on utilization and productivity. The, there there is a fourth one that's less tangible, but the most important, and it's safety. Right. Um, autonomy. Because we've had some good results with with that, haven't we? A absolutely. Look, autonomy is not only do we go ahead and we have an operator that obeys all the driving rules and he does all the right things and stops for things when he needs to, but in, in addition to that, because we're so process driven and because we're so consistent in how we operate and we've got a lot of that data that we can feed back in to show when you know interactions happen or near misses happen, it, it really helps to structure a conversation with operators and what we find is we've been able to help drive the the safety culture on sites that are using autonomy because we're, we're taking one of the variables out and, and so that's tremendous value for customers and you know of course that's that's what we all strive for is safely home right, every right. day. We've had a couple of questions come in on autonomy actually we're gonna have John come back in a minute and kinda of give us an outlook of where that's at I think they'll yep. they'll fit in that space so we'll get to those in just a second so autonomy was very popular, but when we get back to the core product lines, the 794 in particular, John, you've, you're very close to that one. It's uh, it's doing very well, isn't it? Uh, considering uh, you know where it's been, it's come to market complete as a cat truck very quickly. Give us a background on that. Yeah, uh, so we introduced that at Mine Expo, and uh, great interest on the floor uh, at the show for that. Uh, it was awful exciting to be part of that. The uh, when the Cyrus came together with uh, Caterpillar, we we. We're able to get unit rig, and they brought a lot of great engineering knowledge on electric drive trucks. They had a chassis uh, with millions of hours of experience and, and field hours on the, that truck. And we brought in our 795 AC drive system. Uh, we've got over three and a half million of field hours on that. The highest hour units are now 50,000 hours. Uh -huh. So we have a real good understanding of the PCR lives or component replacement lives right. on that truck. And we put that drive system into the, that unit rig chassis, and it worked great to have two proven things coming together. It's probably one of the best uh, new product introductions I've seen because really we had proven items coming out, and it's all cat. You know, it's uh, all the parts are now cat parts. Uh, it's built in our cat facility. It's serviced by cat systems, so it's an all cat truck, and it just hit the ground running out there. Uh, good availability, very consistent high availability. Um, we're getting feedback. It's delivering that true 320-ton truck uh, payload that was expected of it. Uh, it's demonstrating better speed and grade than the uh, leading competitor in that class, and customers are very pleased with the serviceability of it. So it's gone really well. Yeah, good. You can go uh, learn a lot more about the 794 and all the large mining trucks by going to cat.com slash LMT, large mining trucks, where you can look in the resources section and you'll see a link to that. Now, the 794 is brand new, but the 793, 797 are still very popular. In fact, the most popular uh, size classes out there. And although we launched those, the F-Series, in 2008, there's been a lot of updates. And a lot of them have come from the product group, and there's been a lot of work with them, Cameron, in, in the field. So let's talk about that. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, the 793, I have a lot of customers tell me it's the gold standard of cost per ton in the industry. It's, it's our mechanical drive. It has done an outstanding job of delivering low cost. Uh, it's got great traction. It's got a better payload uh, weight ratio out there in the industry. So it's, it's really built a great reputation. 
Uh, and as you mentioned, the 793, that 250 ton class, there's actually more units sold there than above. So it's, it's a very popular unit. We've got trucks, as I said earlier, with 100,000 hours running out there. When we introduced the new version in the 2008 time frame, mm -hmm. we were being driven by emissions mm -hmm. and we had put a new engine into yeah. it. We had new cabs, we made frame changes. We put a lot of different things and we updated that truck quite a bit. Now, those have proved to be very good features and been well received in the industry, but it also drove a lot of new content in the early days. Right. And we, it has taken us a little time for continuous improvement to, to get the new engine worked out, to get the truck settled down. But uh, miners today, you go out and visit, I just was at a site where the trucks are running 8,000, uh, 8,100 hours a year. Right. Um, they're delivering excellent availability. They're delivering the way we measure our quality out of the factory. They're delivering the quality that our customers have expected from our, our mining trucks. They're in line with the classics of the 75, 79, right. and the quality out of the factory. Right. So they've done well. Um, 797 also, you know, um, it's come a long way. We forget that we've been in the 400 ton business for a long right, time. Right. And those trucks are now got over 100,000 hours in the oil sands and being rebuilt and put back to work. We're starting to see component lives coming to where we want them to be on that. Uh, seeing improvements with the new HP body, we call it, where we've right. got a better body performance and saved weight in that. So it's pretty exciting. I'll let Cameron talk about some of the, the, the maintenance and some of the features. Yeah, Cameron, I mean, we've been talking kind of the production and, and autonomy, but it call, comes back that maintenance fits in the middle, kind of that balance yeah. of production and maintenance. So, so maybe, you know, when it comes to production and maintenance, who's in control of that? And then carrying on to John's question, when it comes to in particular to 797, what are the, what are the type of things that have been done and some of the successes that we've seen? So to answer you, the second part first, you know, uh, building off what John had said about the engine as a new platform, the 97s, you know, we, um, you know, it took us some learning to get through that, um, you know, we, but we are now seeing component life on the engines where the right, you know, the expected total amount of fuel consumed through, mm -hmm. through the engine, we're meeting that in a lot of cases now, uh, and in some cases exceeding it. Um, some of the uh, the minor components on that engine that were not a full life PCR or planned component replacement item, we're seeing them get to that level of durability now as well. Um, another key thing is that there's been a lot of focus on that truck to do some maintenance ratio reduction uh, projects. So there's been um, oil, different oil filtration, yeah. uh, the ability to extend oil change intervals and those sorts of things. Um, we know some customers, through the right amount of testing and validation, uh, can get up to a thousand hours oil change uh, interval on the engine, so that's going to reduce our costs. Um, most, uh, depending on altitudes and those sorts of things and soot and those other areas, uh, still are at a 500 hour oil change and some at 250. But I, I want to highlight as well, from the maintenance side, just you know, in the event of being able to get to a thousand hours, or typically a 500 hour all change interval, it doesn't always mean to say that we want the customers to go out and not have to stop the truck for a thousand hours or 500 hours. Uh, we, we do see some customers that, that are very focused on the processes, looking to drive that reliability, and so they will still stop a truck every 250 hours, not do anything on the engine oil or anything in that area, but will focus on the truck executing backlogs and those sorts of things. Um, you know, your first question about, you know, with our games that we have with uh, maintenance production, you know, who owns those issues or who impacts and who has responsibility, you know, the short answer is that we all do. Okay. Um, and we look at it from an application design and maintenance costs, you know, perspective. On the application side, there's certain things that we have absolutely no control over, altitude, rainfall, you know, um, the haul distances and some of those sorts of things. Um, but uh, if it's an uphill or downhill haul, again, we can't control that. But we better make sure that we have a plan and a strategy to understand what's the impact of that application in that situation. Uh, in that application space, though, the things that we do have control over, it's the haul road design, it's the speed, it's rolling resistance, and those sorts of uh, upkeeps that will be owned by the, the operations guys um, and the result is seen by the maintenance guys who have to fix that and drive the cost. So yeah. there's that, that you know, play off between who's responsible and who's accountable, you know. Uh, on the design side, you know, on John's side, 
Um, we don't, we're unable to do a lot of things with the physical size of the machine, you know, the loading pass match, the, the, tool, the loading tools that do load the trucks, and those sorts of things. To some degree, the actual fuel efficiency that we see. Um, but again, same, same way, we have to understand and make sure we manage to it. What we can impact is though how efficient and effective we are on servicing. Um, you know, if we upsize a, 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 a fleet of trucks at a particular mine site, we need to make sure that we now have the right all handling equipment, tooling, uh, PM bay, you know, equipment and those sorts of things that again we're going to develop or deliver um, both processes and, and the uh, results that required. Uh, you know, on the cost side of things, all of those things play back into the costs and uh, the maintenance guys have the end result of having to do a lot of those things. Uh, you had mentioned earlier on, Tony, about the tyre shortage, you know, and so one of the things that was interesting then is we saw a downstream effect that was very positive in the amount of work that was being done with motor graders and, and ancillary right. equipment to clean haul roads, look out for spillage and those sorts of things. We actually saw an improvement on the amount of fit, uh, frame cracking or right. fatigue that goes into there, and that's a downstream effect as well. You know. Yeah, I think it's that ongoing management that the processes and the, and the close relationship between that. It's always been important, but I think it's as important now as you're trying to get a little more, which has could cost a little more on, on that side of it, and then just the information. Now, as you've been around with a lot of mine sites, you've seen really this this collaboration get much better, right? Yeah. And so there's lots of best practices. You can drop Cam in an email or talk to your dealer if you want, if you want some examples there, but it's really, you've seen some significant improvements there, right? Yeah, so, because one of the things that can be seen is, uh, you know, with better collaboration between the maintenance and production department, we like to go to a site and see that any daily operations meeting, there is a maintenance guy there. Everyone understands what the short, medium, and long-term plans are. How do we best utilize a plan down on a lo large loading tool and what other work can we do, you know? Um, so it's always good to see that. We still see a lot of sites that don't do that. Um, you know, both, both Johns are mentioning the increase in utilization as well. Um, and so sometimes we'll see, um, you know, both departments, maintenance and operations, say, well, we're not seeing any improvements in component life, but because of the increased utilization, if you're actually just yeah. measuring in service meter units, just hours, plain hours on the, on the component, in some cases you will actually see more life, you've actually gained more life through the utilization, but you've actually moved a lot more right. material as well. So some of those things where we work together, understand each other's goals, uh, ensure that we've got strategies and things to mitigate and manage any of the risks. So that's really key. Well, great. We've got about five or ten minutes left in our planned program here. I think uh, we had a couple of questions that came in, so maybe we'll, we'll transition it to the, the command or the autonomous space, I think, before yeah. we get to the questions. So the 793 has been key in autonomy, right? Absolutely. And it's kind of the heart, but there's a couple of other trucks that you were going to expand that to, correct? Yeah, so, so the 793F has been our flagship model for autonomy you know, from day one. We, uh, we offered that originally from the factory with autonomy options on it and then also field retrofit kits immediately for the field so that you know, customers have that flexibility to go ahead and take an existing fleet and add on to it with autonomy by using the fleet that they've got. Um, you know, that later this year we'll be releasing the 797F uh, command, so we'll, we'll have that ability to go ahead and run that autonomously as well. And that's going to be a field retrofit kit for the 797F. And, uh, you know, again, back to this idea, do more with less. Customers have got, you know, trucks today that have got a lot of life left in them if we maintain them right. And so we, we think that's the, really the approach to take is be able to take your existing fleet and it doesn't matter your 793Fs and the 797F, any of them that are Fs with 93 and 97 can be converted to autonomy. It's not a... It's not a special thing to do that. So now you're going to go down smaller too, right? We are. We are. We uh, so the the next one on the docket is the 789D. Uh, we got a lot of customers that that might have a mixed fleet, right? They may have some 789s that are, that are used more in some some uh, uh, small working areas or, or in pre-strip <laughs> things like that, where they use the 93s and the 97s to do the bulk earthworks or bulk earth moving at that point. So. The 789D we're going to be releasing uh, autonomously as well, field retrofit kits primarily, because again, existing base of, of trucks out there. So, and then uh, uh, of course we've uh, we've announced that we're also going ahead and you know we've designed a great autonomous system. We've invested a lot of money in it and really made a uh, you know the the premier right. system for the market on on how to operate 
um, uh, with, with autonomy. And we're going to be applying that to competitive units, specifically the, the Komatsu 930. You know, a lot of customers, again, they might have a fleet of 93s and 97s, and they might have some 930s there too. In, in previous years, it was, well, what do I do? I can't go to autonomy without buying all new trucks. Um, and, 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 you know, customers may just not be at that decision point for that, but we don't want to preclude them from being able to move into the autonomous space. So the, we'll be offering a kit for the 930s for, for that kind of an application of mixed fleets for customers and helping them to, to, to utilize the, the base that they've got installed right. already. I think one of the questions that came in was, well, okay, do you even need cabs on autonomous trucks, yeah. right? And we, we know why that discussion came into play, but I think our strategy has been right now to go more to the retrofit, right? Because of, of all those fleets out there that are yeah. that are capable of doing that. Well, it's, it's not just that, Tony. It's, you know, again, I go back to people, process, technology. The, the technology works. That's, that's the easy part, but the people and processes, it, you know how it is trying to change right, people's right. behavior, right? right. It, it's hard. And, and the thing is, is that today, you know, for example, when we want to take a, a, a truck in for maintenance, everybody always asks me, well, how do you take an autonomous truck in for maintenance? And my answer is, well, you don't. Right. You go ahead and you do a mode change on it to make it a man truck, and then you apply all of your maintenance practices right. you do today in the man world, just like you would. Right. So it, it, it helps that change management on a site. It helps you to focus on get the productivity, get the utilization, get get this implemented, and, and and have all of your existing processes that you've got for a lot of these things like maintenance to just occur like they do today. Um, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about you know do we go to a cabless truck, and, and certainly we're looking into that. Right. Uh, but to be honest, even if we had it today, there are so few customers that are truly ready for that step change. Absolutely, yeah. it's it's all about the change management. And, and you know, it, as, as silly as it sounds, people still get nervous about it, right? It, right. It's, well, will the truck stop? Will the truck do this? Will the truck right. do that? And and, and that, that cab being on there, and being able to take control of that as you would any other 793 adds a lot to that. Now, yeah, the future, you know, I think, you know, there's going to be a coming time and place where that makes all the sense in the world, but we've got to get past these people and process challenges really first to, to make sure that all sites are able to extract that value because we can, uh, we can make lots of cool widgets, right. but if the customer can't extract the value out of it, why are we doing it? Yeah, but a lot of discussions too, and we mentioned uh, the, the demo center in Tucson again. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's just amazing the types of uh, visits that you had. I know you've got some programs coming up where you're actually doing more scheduled demonstrations of that, and a lot of them are one-on-one -on -one type of things. So, you know, talk to your cat dealer or get with your cat rep if you're serious about that. So, I guys, we're kind of right up against our time. John, another question that came in, we didn't talk about the 795. What's the status of 795? Yeah, the, uh, you know, I did mention it as far as uh, we've utilized that drivetrain. Uh, it's been uh, well received in the industry. Uh, I would have to say the 360 ton market isn't probably as popular as the 400 and the 320, uh, but it's doing well. It's definitely got a, a strong following, and it continues to be a great tr uh, truck in our lineup. Great, great. Well, guys, so we're right up at our time. We want to make sure we get, let everybody get back to uh, their work. Some of them have their day ahead of them, and some of them obviously are at the end of their day, so we'd like to, to let them get going. I think just kind of some final comments. We'll start, John, with you. Well, I, I would just say that uh, Caterpillar Machines, our dealers, um, and our products are probably the best position to help miners get the most out of their, their current assets, be it more hours out of the life of those products, more hours per year, uh, at lower cost. Yeah, we spent a lot of focus on trucks, too. I mean, not only you mentioned 794, but the updates on the 793, 797. It's, a, it's an ongoing, so you may have a perception of what it is today, but it's not going to, you know, it, it's always getting better. That's the thing that we've always noticed. So, Cameron, from your perspective? Yeah, at a lower level, you know, we would need to drive for that availability uh, always, but we also need to drive for that reliable delivery of availability. Um, at a little high level, you know, we still want to make sure that we see that teamwork and that mutual success between the production and, uh, and maintenance departments and, uh, you know, to be able to be successful in providing that right availability and, and manage costs, we have to work together, so. Yeah, absolutely. John? Yeah, look, for me, I, I think we're all talking about a lot of the same things, but, you know, on specific, I do a lot of work with customers around technology, obviously, and, um, you know, I think every customer really needs to look at what 
you know, whether it's with autonomy or, or anything that you're trying to do, what business problem are we trying to solve? You know, what are we trying to affect by applying autonomy or another technology or practice? What are we really trying to fix and what's the value we're going to get out of it? Right. And, and you got to start with that to, to really understand where are we going. And, and so it's, it's all about the value and, and where you're going to go with that, not just applying a technology or, or a process to something. You know, do it with purpose. Well, gentlemen, very, very informative. Thanks for your time today. And again, thanks for those out there that have joined us uh, for this live uh, uh, cat mining webinar series. A couple of final reminders before we sign off with you today. First off, if you want to send a note to these guys, you can look at the contact section in the upper left. Uh, and, and the webinar will stay live for just a little bit, so you can you can do that. But also, go down to the resources section. There's a subscribe or a sign up. It should be the very first link there. I would like everybody right now, if you have not come, uh, already signed up to receive ongoing communications from Caterpillar, I would suggest you do that right now. And one of the communications you'll get are reminders of upcoming webinars like this one. Uh, our next webinar series uh, is going to be live from Nashville, Tennessee. We've been talking trucks. We're going to talk cash and we're going to talk job site solutions in May, uh, knowing that our mining finance group and job site solutions have some great, we talked what the solution is, uh, but in particular in that space, some things specifically for mining. So that'll be a very good and we're going to, we're going to get out of the CAT TV studio and go down to Nashville and broadcast live from there. I would also, too, if you go to cat.com backslash mining webinars, we have recordings of all of our webinars. There were several in the technology space that we yeah. did, we've done last year. Our last webinar, which was done uh, last month, was on drilling, the launch of a new rotary drill, the MD6250, and we spent some time talking about the command core drilling uh, option, which is, which is uh, we talked about at Mine Expo and is very popular. So I'd ask that you do that here uh, on behalf of Caterpillar, the, the truck group here, and myself. Thank you for joining us for the Caterpillar Mining Webinar Series.